The first time I killed someone was in, was I was 26, 27. He pulled out a handgun, told me to kill that person, the one kneeling in front of him. And uh, I just shot him. Getting cartel and gang members to talk on camera isn't an easy task. Some of the stories they share sound unbelievable, and most were traumatized. So in this video, we'll be going over the 10 most disturbing interviews with cartel and gang members out there. This gets very dark and disturbing. You've been warned. Number 10, Jose Manuel Martinez. Could you tell us how many people you killed? About 36 people. That was Jose Martinez, AKA the Black Hand. He's a former Mexican cartel hitman who's said to have killed 36 different people. Martinez's mom got separated from his biological father and got remarried to his stepfather, who's a renowned drug lord, Pedro Fernandez. I was father by the time I was 16. At that time, that's when my sister got murdered. Now, following in his stepfather's footsteps, Martinez worked for different cartels and killed people on command. He was a different type of killer, taking people out without thinking twice. However, Martinez was arrested in May 2013 for the murder of Jose Ruiz, a friend of his daughter's boyfriend. During his interrogation by Alabama authorities, Martinez did something crazy. He confessed to killing 36 people across at least 12 states without any pressure. All of his victims were adult men, except for one attempted victim, a 17-year-old boy. Martinez also said that most of his murders were debt-related to Mexican drug cartels. I tell him, yeah, you got me so white, motherfucker. Charge me for murder, I don't give a fuck, you can't. In the state of Alabama, he was charged with one count of first-degree murder for the killing of Jose Ruiz and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Then he was extradited to California, where he pleaded guilty to nine counts of murder in October 2015, and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And trust us when we say giving this man a life sentence came after a long deliberation by the jury. More than a dozen of Martinez's family members came for this hearing to talk about how he's a good man and the sacrifices he made to protect his siblings. Once a gangster, always a gangster. Once a killer, always a killer. Think? See. <laughs> Number nine, Jose Vasquez Villagrana. Jose Vasquez Villagrana, Javali. The story of El Javali is one that leaves you in awe anytime you hear it. El Javali is a former member of the U.S. military. He joined in the year 1990, but deserted after he got his U.S. citizenship a year later. He returned to Mexico, where he became the chief operator in smuggling drugs into the U.S. So think for every ton of drugs smuggled into the U.S., El Javali probably had a hand in it. According to the interview you saw earlier, he talked about in detail how he smuggled drugs and which cartels he worked with. He first gets the shipment from Colombia, then sends him to Chiapas and Oaxaca, before transporting him to Sonora by air. At Sonora is a ranch that El Javali owns and also where the aircraft carrying tons and tons of cocaine land. Then from there, El Javali and his men transport the shipment to the U.S. He worked closely with the Beltran Leyva cartel, but after that cartel's partnership with the Zetas happened, he left and began working for Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. However, working with El Chapo earned him a one-way ticket to prison after he was captured at his ranch on February 21, 2010. In the video after his arrest, he discussed how every smuggler at the Sonora border was paid $1,000 for every successful shipment of cocaine smuggled into the U.S. Por teléfono un día hablé con él, que que todo en paz, que se portaron no bien, que esa área no se permitía que nadie cobrara por la plaza, ni secuestrara, ni robara, ni asaltara. But what's really important here is the violence around the border has claimed the lives of over 5,000 people. Number eight, El Cora. Como otros contribuyeron también haciéndolo. Fueron tan solo el día que lo levantamos. El Cora was a sicario for the Sinaloa cartel. He had a crew that took jobs for leaders of the cartel. Some of these jobs included killing, kidnapping, and extortion. And in this disturbing interview, he talked about one of the worst jobs he ever had for the cartel. El Cora's boss, who went by the alias El Buitre, 
ordered El Cora and his men to go kidnap the brother of an assistant prosecutor, who was simply identified as Mario. Mario's brother was involved in the prosecution of a Sinaloa cartel member. El Cora and his men had intel that Mario would be in his office, so they went to his office, broke in, and began looking for him. And according to El Cora's story, they had no idea who this guy was or what exactly he had done. All his boss told him was to go there and kidnap Mario. Now eventually they found Mario and took him to a building where they made a video that went viral at the time. A video that also led to their arrest in the same building they made that video. But don't worry, we'll get to that in a moment. So when they got Mario, a guy named El Charlie came to meet him in this building with a set of questions already written down. The next thing you know, they're accusing Mario of making deals with the La Linea cartel, which is leading the fraction of the Juarez cartel. It's crazy, I know, but it gets worse. After hours and hours of questioning Mario, El Charlie and El Buitre ordered El Cora and his men to dig up a hole, kill, and then bury Mario. So they tied him up, slit his throat, and threw him down into the dug up hole. Around that time, people at Mario's office had contacted Mexican law enforcement, so they were able to triangulate his location to that house where he was tortured. Sadly, he was already dead. But at least El Cora and his men were arrested during that raid. Number 7. Jesus Enrique Rejón Aguilar. Al narcotráfico. ¿Para qué organización? Para los Zetas. Enrique, aka El Mamito, is the former leader of one of the most brutal Mexican cartels, Los Zetas. It's unusual to see a cartel leader granted an interview with the press because of how dangerous they are. But in this case, El Mamito was granted one, allowing us to see an emotionless, cold side of him. I mean, what do we expect? This man has ordered the killing of hundreds and hundreds of innocent people around Mexico. And just like other drug lords before him, El Mamito was once part of the Mexican army. He joined in 93, but after three years, he was assigned to the Special Forces Airmobile Group. He kept climbing up the ranks until 1999 and then deserted the army. However, less than a year later, he was invited by Arturo Guzman de Sena, known as the Z-1, to be part of the 14-man soldier unit forming Los Zetas. And if you think Los Zetas soldiers today are brutal, skilled killers, we'll go ahead and thank Mr. El Mamito here because he oversaw the paramilitary training of new recruits. He trained them like they were fighting for WW3 or an alien invasion. I mean, you get the point. And then El Mamito oversaw the Gulf Cartel's trafficking activities in the state of Coahuila, along with Alejandro Trevino Morales. He was solely responsible for multi-ton shipments of marijuana and multi-kilogram shipments of cocaine from Mexico to the US. And when it came to staining his hands with blood, El Mamito coordinated a failed raid on the max security prison, El Atiplano, in an attempt to free his boss, Osiel Cárdenas Guillén. He planned on using three choppers and over 50 Zeta members to liberate him, but I guess only El Chapo can pull off that kind of stuff. Eventually, on July 4, 2011, El Mamito was captured in a Mexico City suburb without firing a shot. He was then extradited to the US for drug trafficking and organized crime charges, and of course is now serving life imprisonment. Number 6. Rosario Reta. I don't even know why I answered that quite why I said yes. And that was the first time that I, that I had to shoot somebody that very same night. Rosario Reta. Rosario was one of the major hitmen for the drug kingpin, Miguel Trevino. Miguel's the former leader of that brutal criminal organization you know as Los Zetas. Rosario, born in Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas, Mexico in 1990, was raised around the US-Mexican border. Growing up near that border meant he was exposed to a lot of Sicario and cartel member activity. Then at the age of 13, he crossed the lines of morality and ventured into the territory of the Gulf Cartel. One of his friends, Gabriel Cardona, took him to a ranch where he was introduced to Miguel Trevino. At their first meeting, Miguel killed a man right in front of him. We can't possibly imagine what that must have felt like. At the age of 13, he witnessed his first execution. And that's not even the worst of it. Miguel immediately took Rosario under his wing and made him a child soldier for Los Zetas. 
Miguel then took Rosalio and a group of assassins onto the streets of Laredo, Texas to kill anyone and anything they were ordered to. Rosalio and other hitmen under Miguel's squad were paid $500 a week as a retainer and about ten dollars to $50,000 per assassination, depending on the profile of the target. But Rosalio's end came when the Gulf Cartel was engaged in a turf war with the Sinaloa Cartel over the Interstate 35 corridor, which is the north-south highway connecting Laredo to Dallas and is, according to law enforcement officials, one of the most important arteries for drug smuggling. Now, Rosalio was given a target to assassinate by the Sinaloa cartel, but he failed to carry out that mission. The target was unknown, but according to reports, it was a high-profile target. Rosalio knew that if he returned to Trevino, he would be killed for failing his mission. So in turn, he just turned himself in. Well, that may have been the right call, because he is still alive, now serving a 70-year prison sentence for his hundreds of murders. Number 5. El Chapo Esta entrevista es exclusivo para la señorita Kay del Castillo y el señor Sean Penn. It's a rare sighting when you see a drug lord willingly show himself on camera. But what's even more rare is when you see the greatest drug lord in all of Mexico openly do a video describing his childhood to the public. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, arguably top three drug lords of all time, openly agreed to do an interview publicly. El Chapo's the man responsible for making the Sinaloa cartel one of the most established drug trafficking organizations in Mexico. At its prime, the cartel was shipping 80 out of the 100% of cocaine distributed into the U.S. market. And at some point, Forbes list named him as one of the richest men in the world, with his cartel raking in billions of dollars annually. But aside from his cartel, El Chapo has solidified himself as one of the greatest criminals in the world, after breaking out of two different Mexican max security prisons. In 2014, El Chapo's lawyers got in contact with Kate Del Castillo, a well-known Mexican actress. Kate wrote an open letter to Guzman in 2012, expressing sympathy and asking him to spread love instead of dealing drugs. El Chapo was a fan and wanted to have an exclusive interview with her. However, Kate turned down the offer. Later in 2015, Kate and a man named Sean Penn agreed to do this interview with El Chapo in the mountains of Sinaloa. However, this interview gave the DEA and Mexican Armed Forces intel on that location, leading to his third arrest and extradition to the United States. Number 4. Sandra Villa Beltran Remordimiento tampoco porque yo no he hecho nunca mal. Dolor sí, porque he perdido muchos amigos. Sandra, aka the Queen of the South, is a former Mexican drug dealer who has done her time behind bars. She's the daughter of Maria Luisa Beltran Felix and is related to Rafael Caro Quintero, the former leader of the Guadalajara cartel. Growing up, Sandra was already a part of the drug trafficking trade that her parents and relations were heavily involved in. So as a young adult, Sandra dated several well-known drug lords in Mexico. She was married twice, with both her husbands being ex-police commanders who eventually became drug traffickers. However, Sandra gained notoriety in the narcotics underworld after entering into a relationship with one of the major cocaine suppliers from Colombia, Juan Diego Espinosa Ramirez, aka The Tiger. The Tiger was one of the leaders of the Colombian Norte de Valle cartel, one of the major cartels shipping cocaine to Mexico before it was smuggled to the US. Soon enough, Sandra began shipping cocaine into the US through her use of speedboats off the coast of the US border streamlining millions of dollars into her pockets and also earning her name the Queen of the South. But in 2001, everything came crashing down when police found nine tons of cocaine on a ship in the Pacific port of Manzanillo, Colima. The shipment was traced back to Sandra and her lover. And again in 2002, Sandra unexpectedly contacted authorities for help when her teenage son was kidnapped for a $5 million ransom. She paid that ransom. But since she was already under investigation by police, the Mexican authorities began questioning her source of income. And well, it didn't take long to put that together and find out her true criminal identity, leading to her arrest on September 28, 2007, along with her partner Espinosa Ramirez. 
She was extradited to the US in 2012 for her involvement in the nine tons of cocaine shipment that was traced back to her. She was given a term of 70 months in prison, but was eventually released in just four and got deported back to Mexico. I don't know why the US did that, but the Mexican government wasn't going to let it slide. She was rearrested, charged with money laundering, and sent to five more years of imprisonment. Lucky for her, she was released in 2015, and now lives a normal life in Guadalajara. Number 3. Gilberto Rodriguez Orejuela ¿Cuál es la verdad de su participación en el episodio de Pablo Escobar? Bueno, eh, a ver, yo, yo le cuento desde un principio cómo, cómo pasa esto. That was Gilberto, giving his very detailed story about the life of Pablo Escobar in the Medellín cartel before Pablo died. Gilberto, alongside his brother Miguel and another drug dealer, Jose Santa Cruz Londoño, formed the Cali cartel in 1975. They started off by selling marijuana, but when Pablo and the Medellin cartel began exploiting the very lucrative cocaine market, they decided to get in there as well. At first, they all worked together as one big cartel, but over time, personal interests began to kick in and animosity grew between them. Regardless, Gilberto knew a lot about Escobar and how he tried to save his family in the final days leading up to his death. After Escobar's death, though, Gilberto and the Cali cartel took full control of that cocaine market in Colombia. They supplied 80% to the U.S. through Rodriguez's son, Jorge Alberto Rodriguez, and 90% of the European cocaine market. However, his glory days and that of his cartel were short-lived. He was captured two years after Escobar's death and was extradited to the U.S. in 2004. Then in 06, both him and his brother Miguel were sentenced to 30 years in prison after pleading guilty to charges of conspiring to import cocaine to the U.S. And in May 2022, Gilberto died at a prison medical center at the age of 83. Number 2. Double R We are all bad guys. That's the reality. Why? Because at the end of the day, the work is the same. Like we said, as we go down this list, the ranking of cartel members just gets more intensified. What you just saw is the rarest cartel interview you would probably ever come across online. He's a high-ranking leader of the New Jalisco Generation Cartel, or CJNG. And his name is Ricardo Ruiz, a.k.a. Doble Ara. Double R started his criminal career in the town of Jalisco, but later on expanded to Michoacán, Guanajuato, and Zacatecas. He's the one many say is responsible for spreading and filming all those disturbing videos of CJNG members displaying their weapons. So if you've ever been traumatized by those videos, blame this guy. But anyways, we can see the man's extremely dangerous. You don't need us to tell you that. He's a freaking leader of the CJNG. These guys are ruthless. He's linked to the death of the Secretary of Tourism in Jalisco, Jose de Jesus Gallegos Alvarez. And he's said to be under the command of Juan Carlos Valencia Gonzalez who in turn is considered the creator of El Mencho's elite groups. Double R has caused a lot of harm in the states he controlled. However, for a tough guy, his arrest was and probably still is one of the easiest of all crime lords in Mexico. Double R's fun to throw in some of his best parties for narco corrido singers, who write ballads about drug traffickers and their trade. He likes to invite guests, such as Luis Arcon Riquez, who authorities refer to as Jalisco New Generation Cartel's exclusive singer. The Mexican army had a close eye on Conriquez's movements, and after intel revealed he was going to a party at a hidden ranch, the Mexican government still decided to stay quiet until two months later, when they went in to arrest Double R. He was successfully captured, but his men fought back, leading to his release. Double R still a loose cannon in the streets and is ready to shoot down anyone on the order of CJNG. And number one, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. Puesto que perdí todo, perdí la sensibilidad, los oídos, los ojos. Han pasado 32 años. This interview is disturbing in so many ways. Here's why. Miguel, who was known as the boss of bosses, spoke in an exclusive interview with Telemundo, where he revealed the harsh realities he's facing in prison. Miguel's one of the founders of the Guadalajara cartel in the 1970s, and is said to be one of the men who started the shipment of cocaine into the US from Mexico. 
The Colombian cartel transported their product to Mexico through cargo planes, and then Miguel and his associates would arrange to ship that product into the U.S. through the U.S.-Mexican border. But instead of taking cash payments for their services, they took 50% of the product and sold it with their associates in the U.S. They raked in a whopping $8 billion annually for the Guadalajara cartel. However, Felix Gallardo was arrested on April 8, 1989. He was charged with the kidnapping and murder of DEA agent Enrique Camarena by both the Mexican and U.S. government, as well as his involvement in racketeering, drug smuggling, and multiple violent crimes. Felix Gallardo was initially sentenced to 40 years in prison, but after serving only 28, a 2017 retrial sentenced him to an additional 37 years. From this point on, he just became a shadow of himself. In the interview, it's revealed that Miguel Felix is suffering from deafness, loss of an eye, vertigo, and blood circulation problems. In his own words, he said, My health is terrible. My body is half paralyzed. My family's digging a grave so that I may be buried next to a tree. My life expectancy is non existent. I lost everything. I lost sensitivity, my hearing, my eyesight. However, there might be a little luck here, because after more than 37 years of incarceration, Felix Gallardo was granted house arrest in 2022. A statement from Mexican President Andres Obrador as to why he did this reads, I don't want anyone to suffer. I don't want anybody to be in jail. I don't want anybody to suffer. 